although uh, of course we're all very mindful that uh, there's still uh, significant uh, COVID case numbers and particularly in the hospitals as I'm sure Rosanne is seeing with, with her own clinical work. Um, we're recording the session, uh, just for those of you uh, who'd like to know that. Um, and we're absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Roseanne Kenny. Um, as you all know, uh, Roseanne, um, she's an award-winning physician and researcher. She's head of the academic department of gerontology at Trinity. And she has been there since 2006, exactly the same year as I came to Trinity myself at College Health. Um, you probably know her best as the founding principal investigator uh, on the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, TILDA, and um, the research that has come from the work in TILDA has been absolute groundbreaking for, for us, uh, for all of us, and Roseanne is an incredible communicator, and um, you have heard of her, you've seen her, you've heard her, um, and we're really fortunate uh, today that she's going to speak to us for 30 minutes and then is happy to stay on for a little while after that. And we will answer any questions that you might have um, or that you are topics that you could raise. So Roseanne, absolutely delighted that you could join us and I'll let you take over from there. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks for that generous uh, introduction. I'm sharing my screen now. Yep. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. And welcome. And on this gorgeous, glorious day. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you for half an hour about age proofing um, and maybe give you a flavor of the opportunities that we as individuals can embrace, irrespective of our chronological age, to improve our overall health in the context of aging. But first of all, maybe to set the scene with some demography and um, some of the underlying biology which underpins aging. Really, for most of um, mankind, about three to 4% of the population, of a population, lived to over 65. As far as we know, this is Socrates, and he, of course, because of his relatively radical uh, philosophy at his time, was forced to take self-poisoning. But his three best friends, whose chronological age we, has been documented, lived to 80, 79, and 85, respectively. 22% of Germans today, alive today, are over 65, and 26% of Japanese. They're pretty remarkable figures. And if we actually go and look, and look at that trajectory in the context of the last 200 years, what we see is, that since accurate records started to be kept in the 1800s, there has been a linear increase in age span. This is since 1800, 200s. An increase of about 2.2 years every 10 years. And it seems to be continuing. Now, in terms of absolute numbers, how this translates is by, in 2015, there were 6.17 million people over 65. By 2025, three years time, there'll be a billion, 12% of the total world population. And again, in, in, if you're trying to get your head around that, a baby girl born today will live three months longer than her sister born last year on average. So that's what those demographic changes translate into. Now, globally, the biggest increase is going to be in the older old, those over 85, as you can see here, and over 100. When I was a young junior doctor, it was really unusual to have 100 year olds admitted to our wards and, and rightly or wrongly, we'd go up to have a look at someone who was aged 100. I wouldn't do that now, it's commonplace. So, so the biggest increase we're going to see over the next decade will be in over 85s and over 100s and that's what we're already seeing. Why? Everyone says, well, why? Why are we living longer? 
the reasons are self-evident. Clearly, we don't have exact reasons for why, but it's a pretty good guesstimate that it's because of better health care. It's because of wider embracing of immunization, because of antibiotics, constant advances in medical technologies, better quality water, food, better hygiene overall. And I'm talking globally, not just in our own environments, better housing, better lifestyle. We're much more aware, as any of the listeners of today's uh, talk are, are, are showing that they're aware of lifestyle behaviors and how we can employ those for our own better health. And we're more prosperous. But the issue is, and what we're as academics challenged with finding solutions to, is the fact that we will spend about one fifth of that precious extended lifespan or that precious lifespan with some sort of a disability, with some sort of a diagnosis or a disease, a fifth with disability, that's a lot. And despite the extended lifespan, we're not seeing dramatic changes in healthy lifespan, disease-free lifespan. So the implications there are we're living longer, we've got new technologies and new interventions which can enhance that. And when we get sick during that longer lifespan, we've also got new therapies and new treatments that can address those illnesses, but it doesn't stop us having them and having disability associated with that. So our big challenge is a couple fold. What can we do to enhance healthy lifespan, not just lifespan? Are there early markers, we call them biomarkers, early indicators, which indicate an aging process or underlying pathophysiology that we can do something about? Can we better understand the cause of aging as well as age-associated disorders? And then by having a better understanding of the causes and early biomarkers so that we get in there early, is it possible to personalize our interventions thereafter? And that's where this whole field of geroscience and medicine is going. Now, in that context, I want to introduce the concept of herit heritogeneity, differences. And with due respect to new mothers who look at their newborn and they're the most unique looking baby in the world, pretty much all babies look the same. They certainly do in the context of what I think is the next slide, which is these six men, they look hugely different. They're all around 62 when these photographs were taken. And you can pick out the ones who look older and skin and looks are actually a pretty good indication of biological aging. You can pick out the ones who look older, can't you? You can probably pick out the ones who have kind of had a hard life or given themselves a hard life and not had particularly good health behaviors. And maybe even those who have had a little bit of help surgically to look a less than 62. But my point is compared to the babies, they all look so different. So despite being the one chronological age, all of those men, they have different biological ages. And that's what we're really trying to capture. How do we measure biological aging? What constitutes the changes in biological aging that we can modify so that we stop diseases? Now, assistance with that comes from long-lived other species. This is the bowhead whale, the longest-lived mammal, to our knowledge, the longest lived, lived to around over 200 years. Amazing. This is a 
sponge, an Antarctic sponge. And again, a very immobile creature, very, very slow growth rates. The longest lived of this species, we believe to be about 1500 years old. And we sell, we share a whole lot of background cellular and biological activity with the two I've just shared with you. So if we could understand at a cellular level, what it is that's governing this slow pace of aging, for example, in the sponge, we might be able to translate that into human studies. This one is, this beautiful creature is an eternal jellyfish. And it's called eternal because to our knowledge, it doesn't have a natural limit to lifespan. It moves from polyp to adult and back to polyp again. And we do know that what those long lived species have in common is resistance to oxidative stress in the cell. And oxidative stress is an imbalance in our cells between the production of energy. So we eat food, our cells concentrate on using that food to produce energy. That's all they're about, energy production, depending on which the organism is. If it's the brain focusing on energy so that you can concentrate, have good memory, good executive functioning. If it's the heart, energy so that the heart can continue to pump, et cetera. Oh, so what happens when we produce energy, however, is there are toxic byproducts. That's so with the production of energy in any field not just biology. And what we have to do as a system is get rid of those toxins really quickly, because if we don't, we put stress on the cell, oxidative stress. And it's that oxidative stress which enables the accumulation of toxins. And that's where we think age-related processes start kicking in and the cell just isn't functioning as exquisitely well as it should, where it produces, takes in food, produces energy, and dumps the toxins quickly, kind of like a washing machine. Throw the clothes in, you need them to produce energy to get clean, pour the hot water in, clean water, but you have to get rid of the dirty water or you're not going to achieve your function. So, in the context of aging cells, we know that there are a whole lot, and I'm not going to into these, but of changes which take place in aging cells. Now, what we're not sure about is if these changes, like epigenetic alterations or altered intercellular communications or deregulated nutrient sensing, if those changes are the cause of the cell aging or as a result, but we do know that oxidative stress is linked to all of these processes. So oxidative stress links to these, these are linked to the aging cell. It's the direction of causality that we're still exploring. Okay, very often people, patients particularly, will say to me, I have great genes, doctor, I don't need to worry. I had a patient this morning and, you know, I was trying to talk to him about maybe losing some weight and not drinking so much. And he said he didn't need to worry because his mother lived to some fine old age and his father lived to fi some fine old age. Well, he's a bit right, but very little. We know from identical twin studies so the genes are the same, that identical twins don't necessarily age the same way. There's heterogeneity in aging in identical twins. And you can see here that these two identical twins, this man looks older, and these two identical twins, this woman looks older than her identical twin. 
And because of the twin studies, we've been able to explore what other factors might influence aging. But we do know because of the twin studies and others that only 20 or at the very best 30, and it probably is 20 or less, of our lifespan is attributable to our genes, to my patients that he was talking about today, mother and father. The rest, he's got control of. The rest are behaviors, environmental factors. And they're the ones, by and large, that we can modify. And they're the ones that are pertinent to Trinity Health Week. And these changes in relation to environmental factors start really, really early. Let me show you this study, which is the Dunedin study, which is a longitudinal study in a cohort in New Zealand. They're now in their mid to late forties. It was a thousand odd babies born in one year. And like we do in Tilda, followed the same a thousand at very frequent intervals, except we've picked people over 50. They took babies and upwards. And they were able to measure their biological clocks. Now there's loads of clocks being developed. None of them are accurate enough to definitely tell you your biological age, but some of them are getting there, they're getting closer. But the point I want to make about this is that at the time they measured the biological clocks in this study, everybody was aged 38. But their biological aging at the tender age of 38 was hugely different. Some of the 38 year olds were behaving biologically like 28 year olds. Some were behaving almost like 50 year olds. So even at that tender age, we're seeing heterogeneity. And what's also interesting is they did a whole lot of other measures of the functioning of other tissues, the thyroid, the liver, muscle, the heart, etc., and found that aging physiologically of all of those systems was mapping with the biological aging we're talking about with the clocks and the big drivers were poor socioeconomic circumstances in childhood adverse childhood events like divorce or death of a parent depression in a household etc or bad health behaviors at 38 having smoked drink under stress not sleeping etc they were the drivers in these relatively young people <coughs> for accelerated biological aging. Now, some of the factors we could do something about you mightn't be aware of, and, and I, I love this part of general science, the fact that the quality of relationships you have can actually modify your pace of aging. People who have more good friendships or good quality relationships with relatives, and it's a whole other lecture, um, how, how relatives influence our, our aging process. Age more slowly if they're good quality and good, good numbers of relationships. So social engagement and relationships matter. De-stressing matters hugely. Exercise, everybody knows about exercise, but as we get older, it's not just aerobic exercise that's good for as an antioxidant and influences all of those hallmarks of aging I was talking about. It's also, um, sorry, aer aerobic exercise, but it's also resistance training. Having a purpose in life, imagine something like having a purpose can influence what's happening at a biological level. And we know this from studies in the blue zones. And of course, weight, weight is a big issue. And the, one of the, the reasons, apart from, war and pestilence, which we're experiencing now, that that linear in continuing increase in demography might change is because of the obesity and diabetes uh, crisis or epidemic. So these are all antioxidants. So they help to balance that oxidative stress I was talking about in the cell, which we know is associated with aging of the cell. Now, the blue zones are areas in the world, they're ages apart. Look how far apart they are. And yet, they share a whole lot of those antioxidant components I've just shown you in common. And the thing about them is, people live longer, but not just longer, 
For example, people in Sardinia live significantly longer than in mainland Italy in the blue zone area. They live without chronic diseases as well. That's what's important. They're only called blue zones because Michel Poulain, who did the, discovered the zones and drew, he drew big blue rings around the zones as he validated longevity in the, in, in the zones. They're all by the sea, they're all on heights, but they all share de-stressing rituals, they, they, uh, lots of exposure to nature, lots of physical activity, um, very much either faith-based or community-based um, existence where, where people feel part of a, a community, have close friends and strong social networks, great respect for uh, elders, two to three to four generations sometimes living in houses, and purpose. And even some of them have special terminology for purpose. This is what the Okinawans call it. And this is what the Nikoyans call it, call, call, call it. You know, knowing why you get up in the morning makes you healthier, happier, and adds up to seven years to lifespan. It's remarkable. And they all have downshift, de-stressing. Now, now, again, they vary. Uh, the the um, Adventists pray, the Icarians take a nap, and the good old Sardinians have happy hour together. They don't drink alone. They have happy hour together with a, a, a small glass or two of wine. Gardening is a great de-stressor, and we know that if in randomized controlled trials, if people are exposed to gardening and reading, those who are exposed to gardening, both, both, both activities reduce our stress hormones and neural activities, but those exposed to gardening are more so. This study was done on young cohorts in their early 20s, and it's very pertinent to our younger listeners. But to everybody, it's blue light. Blue light exposure has become, of course, our normal activity. Zoom, iPhones. We're not, we haven't evolved though with blue light, or at least we've evolved with very little blue light. We've mostly evolved with yellow light exposure. So this is kind of new. And this interferes with our superchiasmic meatus. And, that, and that's the clock in our head, which actually controls circadian rhythm in all of our cells, but also sleep. And what it is, is this is sleep duration on the, on the y-axis and the x-axis is hours of screen exposure. So if you know in a day screen exposure, you'll sleep on average six and, and three quarter hours. But if you've more than four, you're right down in this case to five, 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 and, five and a quarter hours. So how much you're exposed to blue light affects your sleep, but particularly immediately before sleep. The other thing the blue zones have in common is mostly plant-based diets, but certainly diets free of red meat with low or no sugar, low or no salt, and low in refined grains or any processed foods. And the Okinawans have a lovely saying, something from the sea and the land every day, coupled with turmeric and ginger. So I think we have a lot of lessons to learn from those blue zones, which have informed our science today. And the other final thing I want to talk about, David, is something else they share. And despite being, in some cases, a few thousand miles apart, they all eat to 80% satiation. They never push the chair from the table and say, thank God I'm full. And we know that caloric restriction makes a big difference to the aging process. These are two rhesus monkeys. One has experienced a restricted diet since birth. They're both aged 20 of 40% of expected, a reduction in 40% of normal intake. Whereas the, and that's, and that's this one. Whereas the other one had normal food intake. And you can see the eyes are more sunken here. The nostrils are bigger, which is what we see in humans as we get aged. Our, our mouths start to sink, our cheeks sink and we have less less hairy, and that's what they look like from the side. They're exactly the same chronological age, but look how different um, they appear to be, the calorie restricted and the standard diet. Um, for centuries, we've been looking for the elixir of youth, and I've shared some of the elixirs that we know of today. The Chinese 
uh, in, in one of their most cultured periods, lost almost a third of emperors through self-poisoning with alchemists, co concoctions like mercury, cinnabar, gold and sulfur that they'd pulled together for longevity. But of course, it caused them to die. And despite that, it took 300 years for the, for the penny to drop. And today, of course, we've got Silicon Valley racing to the finish line to find a cure for aging, putting millions and billions into research for the magic pill. But no matter what you're being told by the media, we don't have it yet. And although we know a lot about these hallmarks and the accumulation of toxins, I can assure you that there is still in all the estimates we've got of age-related processes in the cell, telomeres, epigenetics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, all correlate with chronological age, but they don't correlate with each other. So we've a long way to go before we find our single explanation. And in that context, I would say that behavioral work that we've shared, there's a great evidence behind it. In the interim, retain a healthy cynicism regarding claims that we've cracked aging. Not yet, but I do believe we will certainly make an impact on healthy lifespan in very short. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roseanne. That was... Uh an absolute whistle stop tour <laughs> through um, many of the factors that uh, affect the aging process. Uh, I suppose lots of you would have already read Roseanne's book, um, Age Proof, you know, which is the new science of health, new science of living a, a healthier and longer life. And there's so much to take. Uh, that's what it looks like. <laughs> that's what it looks like, exactly. Well, I'm delighted it's there. Thank you. Um, it's, it's so interesting, um, and as someone who, uh, who was part of my GP training, I'm, I'm just trying to work out how long ago, it was exactly 31 years ago, did a geriatrics, what was then a geriatrics rotation with incredible clinicians. Absolutely, they were just incredible clinicians that I worked with. Uh, you know, they were lifelong geriatricians. And the idea that some of the the nuances this it's 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 a balance between um science and art that Roseanne is really uh, is really describing to us um the the idea that we as humans could influence our own dna our own aging by things like friendship by it, it seems like some things are intuitive you know eating well seems intuitively that that would that would make sense um sleeping, eating, all these things, living a good and healthy lifestyle. But the idea that relationships, that um, interactions, that purpose in life, not just help us to live longer, but actually do that by influence, influence in our DNA is, is actually incredible. You know, okay. it's absolutely incredible. Um, and I suppose there's some questions coming, coming through, Roseanne. Um, just some specific questions first. Uh, we've been asked about the importance of breastfeeding in 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 uh, in early in early development, presumably. Great, great this question. I mean, there's just yesterday I read an article in the in the Lancet, looking at monozygotic and dizygotic twins, um, to actually see, you know, an identical and non-identical twins. Really, how much is genetic? And how early does it start? And it reaffirmed that it starts really, really early in the first number of years of our number of months of life. A lot of those hallmarks I'm talking about and the epigenetic changes particularly are imprinted very early on. One of our associate professors is actually specializing in this, the life course and aging. Breast, breastfeeding, all of that is very, very good evidence now. We know anecdotally it was good, et cetera. We didn't understand why, but more and more we're, we're finding biological um, uh, explanations which are good substrates for the observational data to date. 
Yeah, another question is, um, and I suppose it could be opened out, it's, it's a specific question about Parkinson's disease and will it be more common as we get older? But I suppose it could be applied to any neurodegenerative disease. Yeah, I mean, diseases. it's a great question. But, you know, so any of the neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's, dementia, and um, although it's interesting, one of the risk, one of the main risk factors, even for Alzheimer's dementia, is um, good management of cardiovascular disease, i.e. blood pressure, in midlife. And that's becoming much more, you'll know this data from general practice, much more commonplace now. Um, so there does appear to be a little bit of an attenuation in the expected increase in dementia. And, it, and it's expected that actually managing midlife cardiovascular risks, blood pressure, heart disease, cholesterol, et cetera, will make a difference to ultimately to, to dementia. Um, and Parkinson's should increase. The sort of vascular risk management does not, however, influence Parkinson's disease. But people with Parkinson's disease, there are new treatments coming on stream all of the time to manage the symptoms, not to turn Parkinson's disease around and cure. Yeah, and, and just extrapolating on that a little bit in terms of um, disability and aging, I mean, you said about, you know, 20% of our life is on average is going to be in this disabled situation or less able situation. But um, I was really interested to read in, in, in your book about um, the idea that, you know, that um, delaying aging merely yields a kind of a, a one time benefit. This is the, the philosophy that like if we so if we all live to be 150, um, that in that will still have huge uh, impact on the massive impact on the health service, you know, as if things will be the same. Um, now for 80 year olds as they will be in 80 years time. So I, I suppose, could you tell us a little bit about the difference between um, a one-time benefit uh, approach to uh, aging and whether the fact that we will live longer will mean that we will, could be healthier for longer? Oh yeah, so that's the purpose. And I mean, the, oh, everything I've suggested is exactly the latter. It's with a view to modifying the latter, or influencing the latter. Um, and and it, it, if, if we manage to compress the diseases associated with aging by seven years, that will have a huge impact on the extended healthy life years, which is, which is what we're trying to do. The other, I think, very heartening thing is, and again, this was only in the last few weeks, a, a lovely study from the University of Bergen showed that the earlier you start, the better, no question. But it's never too late. And they actually took a large meta-analysis of studies associated with diet and aging. And then they, they, um, they applied models to, if you were to introduce the optimum diet versus no change in diet, not a very good dietary pattern, versus a middle of the road, which is kind of where we all are. Nobody's going to be you know, perfect, squeaky clean all their lives. What, what sort of an impact can you have age 20, 60 and 80? And they showed an impact at each of those time intervals, much more age 20, like nearly a 10 year increase in lifespan, potentially healthy lifespan, but you know, 3.4 years at age 80, if you just introduced it at age 80. So I suppose my tagline is earlier the better, never too late. That's incredible at the age of 80 to introduce it and, and to see a 3.4 year. Oh, what, a, what an incredible uh, piece of information. Yeah. Could I ask you about social policy um, and aging? Because it's a very interesting section in the book, specifically looking at Denmark and Japan and around the social policies that they have and the impact of that on longevity, but also on health and the percentage of people that they have, for example, in nursing homes compared to here in Ireland as, as we get older. How do you see yeah. that as, as uh, for us moving forward as policy? So for the last 40 years, on the, 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 there's, there's a scale, a social happiness scale uh, used uh, throughout Europe. And for the last 40 years, Denmark have topped the charts with respect to that. And when you, when you dig down to see why might that be, they do two things. They have great respect for education and children and you know, preschool care, et cetera, and, and resources. And they really resource health and aging well, those two, those two extremes of life. And the middle bits kind of seem to take care of themselves. 
Consequently, they're one of the happiest populations as a result. Now, they're not absolutely as healthy as the Swedes, actually, because they, they're, they're, their health behaviors aren't quite as good. Um, you know, there's a little bit more obesity and smoking and alcohol is, is, is slightly more prevalent. But, but they're top of the European charts for longevity and healthy longevity also. And um, not top, but in the top, in the top numbers. So that's the idea, that's the example behind Sweden. And again, great respect for intergenerational, and, and Japan is the same, great respect intergenerationally. But the Japanese kind of are really involved, again, from get-go and investment in education. You know, they're constantly broadcasting exercise programs, gymnastics, whatever, for school children and beyond. And it starts early, I would say, in both of those cultures. That's the first point you raised. You raised a nice point about, about the, their, uh, their added approach to aging in Denmark, a model I really, really like, and that's aging in place. I don't just like it. I actually think our institutionalization in nursing homes of people as they get older and more vulnerable and they in need, we'll, we'll look back on that in years to come and think, oh my God, weren't we such an uncivilized society? What they do in Denmark, is they enable people to stay in their homes and they facilitate them aging in place, whatever their needs are. They don't say, okay, that's X number of hours of home care. I'm sorry, you're going to have to go into a nursing home. That doesn't happen. If it does, in a very small proportion, relative to ours, tiny, what they do is they have homes, houses with about five apartments in them, a central nursing pod, and couples can move into these apartments and they're looked after. And, you know, if one of the couple is frail and the other isn't, the frailer one's looked after, obviously, but then if that person passes, the, the other member of the couple can stay on in their apartment, but with the central nursing pod. They're the models, they work. And what's even more important is they've shown that they are not more cost expensive than the systems we run at the moment. Sure. And in these, in these societies, is terminology and the use of terminology around aging, um, is that much different to us, to us here um, in terms of the use? I mean, the use of the word elderly or yeah. whatever you, words that have negative connotations, are, are they less likely to be in use than, than here or? Yeah, so so um, so we, we would have very negative language, um, uh, is it, but, but, but this is worldwide, this is worldwide. I mean, but, uh, um, it, but studies have shown that as people get older, they don't want to be called elderly, they want to be called older, because as you're younger, you're younger, you're not, you know, they don't want to be called seniors, because there are no juniors, you know, so it's common sense. And of course, with COVID, there was a lot of media exposure to, I would say, quite ageist attitudes. I think ageism is the one, the last great stand we've got to take and modify. We're getting there with sexism. We have a bit to go. OK, girls, but we're getting there. We're getting there with racism. We have a bit to go, but we're getting there. But, you know, ageism is hardly ever on our radar. And yet, short of dying, it's the only alternative. So it, it, this it, matters for all of us. Sure, it does. And bringing that then in, in terms of retirement, compulsory retirement ages for people. Um, I've seen this amongst colleagues, even in Trinity, really excellent colleagues, didn't want to stop, really wanted to keep going. And but we're forced to stop because of compulsory retirement. It's illegal in the States. I mean, it's just and it's, it's been so for a couple of decades now. And um, I'm sure we will go there because in 2012, for the first time ever globally, the number of people over 65 surpassed the number under the age of five worldwide. And it's and those graphs are continuing to go like that. The under fives declining, declining, and the over 65s increasing, increasing. So we will have to engage with a skilled, you know, experienced workforce more going forward. A, a voting workforce as well. As, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Of, um, the other thing I suppose in your book, people are going to be struck by the critical importance of friendships and um, the critical importance of um, being embedded in societies. And of course, they'll, they'll all your all, all the preamble around your book. So, so uh, the, intimacy as well 
for yeah. other people. In, yes, um, intimacy, yeah. Intimacy and 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 friendship are, are incredibly important. You know, and well, first of all, friendship is. And as people get older, but it's not just as people get older, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking now to, to our students in, in Trinity. It's really important to culture friendships and it's important to retain and maintain and sustain those friendships throughout your life. And those friendships that you make in college are actually some of the best friends you'll have. You, you know, they get you, they know you. And, you know, at no stage should you feel you have to prove yourself with, with those friendships. So they're solid. But throughout our lifespan to remember friendship, remember how important it is. We're gregarious animals. We need other animals. In animal experiments, if you render a rhesus monkey friendless, the lymph nodes start to upregulate genes that we know are associated with inflammation and negative immunity. So, uh, and also increased fibrinogen in the system, which is a clotting factor. So friendlessness <clears throat> is really bad for our biological systems. Yeah, it's very interesting you mentioned even the medical students there because uh, in the first week of their first year in, in medicine every year, I, I do a short talk to them. And in that talk, I speak about the importance of friendships and the friendship that they will develop in the class that they're sitting in at that moment. That, you know, in 25 years time, if they're up with a sick child in the middle of the night or have an elderly parent, there will be somebody in this room that they will be speaking to. And I'm sure that extrapolates across the whole university for, you know, uh, the, the way the, the friendships that are built uh, at that stage really are lifelong and critical friendships for, for people and very um, stabilizing friendships for people. Um, yeah. Yes. And the other thing about the medical students, just while you allude to it, I was really struck in the book as well about your speaking about um, a diagnosis and the critical importance of history taking. Um, you know, 90% of getting the diagnosis is taking the history. That really resonated with me. And um, we're all rushing all the time. Uh, medics were, were rushing and sitting down and taking the history is, is just so critical. And particularly for this age cohort, I think taking the history and make, making time to take the history is so, so critical. Anybody, so the people will be listening to this, you know, and saying, uh, well, that's, that's obvious, that's self-evident. I'm sorry, as we get older in practice, we yeah. don't do it. Isn't that true, David? I mean, you, 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 I call it slow medicine. Yeah. It's not as exciting as rushing somebody down for the latest functional imaging or sticking an angio in, etc. But it, the patient will nearly always tell you. What's the patient going will, on. All, it, yeah, almost you always. The patient will tell you. The patient. Yes. And, and the longer we go on, the more we realize that. But uh, the last thing I really want to tell you, because I'm conscious of time, Roseanne, ask you is really about about Tilda and and the the whole Thank project. You. The project. Thank what you for that opportunity, because I should have prefaced this by saying, you know, this book. And, it's, and the data uh, is based on, we've published over 600 papers in the Tilda study over the last 12 years, and it's based on that evidence, coupled with evidence from other, from other uh, groups that we collaborate with or who are involved in this space uh, worldwide. It's a fantastic study. It's a longitudinal study. It's publicly archived after each wave. And what I mean by longitudinal is you go back to the same people every two years. So, uh, over the age of 50 and at its inception it represented one in 156 people over the age of 50 in Ireland. We follow them every two years, the same people, we're 12 years into it now and I'm hoping we will continue and replenish the sample because it's such a risk rich source of information, not just for discovery, but for our policymakers to watch what's happening in Ireland with this important cohort. Before Tilda, there wasn't any other data source and we were using Scottish data and Scottish populations, Demographics, yeah. cohorts to make decisions. And do you have a sense that people in the country feel a real ownership of Tilda? Because I very much have a sense of that. People, there's such a collaboration of so many, you know, there was such a, a long term process for so many people who were involved as researchers or as patients or as subjects, and then all the people who were writing projects on it. And then the communication that you had to do around Tilda, you know, the national communication. Do you feel that there's a, an, 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 that there's a sense of ownership in the country of the whole project? Yeah, I've, I've never uh, thought of it like that, but abs absolutely. I mean, first of all, I would say the participants have given so much of their time at each health wave between the different types of questioning we do and the t different sort of tests. They can give anything up to five hours 
every time, you know, to, 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 of their time. We've had very little attrition that's dropout. People have stayed in the study. They feel part of it. It started when the recession was really bad in 2009. And when we did some of the qualitative work around participation, found that people of that age group were terribly conscious of the brain drain from Ireland and emigration as a result of the recession and wanted, they wanted to return back to the community something. And that spirit seems to have continued. We work with almost, almost every single university in Ireland is collaborating with Tilda. We've trained a hundred surveyors who are now really skilled to go into the field to do testing. I don't know how many researchers we've trained. I mean, at the moment, we have a team of 45, but, you know, and that's it's been going for 12 years and energy one time, there's that. So, so there's a whole skill set behind this. But what we've also done is built really rich international relationships with, with other universities um, globally. Um, and there are now 27 studies, many of whom have come on board since TILDA, replicated TILDA, been to TILDA to see how we do it, Korea, China, Brazil, India, et cetera. And, uh, and, you know, it's just a growing rich resource for research, but also, and discovery, but also for, uh, for policy. I want to stress the policy piece because we, we try as hard as we can to share with policymakers. And for, to give you an example, with COVID, we repurposed everything we were doing. For many, many months, all the researchers just dropped their grants, whatever they were looking at, they looked at the data set and they said, OK, we know this is what people look like in Ireland. Let's look at, at it almost by county, county, local authority level. So what are the policy things government could introduce which might make a difference? Or if they did introduce that, who would it impact on? Who would it affect in terms of need and not meeting need? Well, you've just answered the last question that I was going to ask you, which was, what about COVID and TILDA? And uh, so that's actually, you just answered it. Um, so uh, I suppose, Roseanne, I'd really like to thank you for giving up your time. And it's been such an interesting talk. The talk is really only the tip of an iceberg of an incredibly interesting and easy to read book. Like it's a beautifully written book. Um, it's such a, a balance between, you know, literature and science and art. It's, it's just a beautifully written book. And um, I'd recommend that you all go out and get your copy, needless to say. Uh, I could show you mine here. <laughs> it is. Um, and uh, just again, thank Roseanne and the team. And thank you, uh, Louise uh, and Martina and Megan um, for organizing the, the webinar. And if there are any questions we haven't got to, I'll try and answer them in the chat afterwards. And enjoy the rest of College Health and Sport Week. And thanks, Roseanne. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Enjoy.